You're going to say that's not always true, and you're absolutely correct. That's not. But if you remember right, Christ came to serve man. And salvation is there for us to serve other men. We're there to be unselfish and to touch the world and not be afraid during times like this to reach out to the world, even though it may risk us doing what we should do. <clears throat> We're there to not provide a place for leadership or a place to speak or sing, and we're there to reach out to the world around us. And that includes, though, the leadership to do exactly that. We're to reach the slums, the dens, the, the, people, the place, the ghettos, the place where people live. We're there to reclaim the heathen, whether they be rich or whether they be poor. We're there to fight with evil. Put down falsehood. Put down the things that we so often say we hate, but seemingly we too often join in with. We're not here to exist for ourselves or the church, church's glory. Christ didn't exist for himself. His glory was what he laid aside. And the church has to be careful that we too lay aside our glory, which is actually his glory. And we do that, which we need to do because it's the right thing to do. It's not our dignity, it's not the glory of the church, it's not all of the things that we sometimes do as a church. It's the idea that we're here to serve mankind. We're here like Christ to actually lift up God the Father and his Son now, Jesus Christ. He was willing to get into the muck and mire of the day, and yet he was also willing to die for us. And now today he's been lifted up for glory to sit at right hand of God the Father. It brings hope. It brings the news of forgiveness. It really, you know, that's, the whole point is we're here to, for a second, a spiritual aid. We're here to <clears throat> do war and battle, not with flesh and blood, but with uh, power of prayer and that which of service to mankind. We're to teach what sin is. We're to pull down spiritual tyrannies that, to teach the forgiveness of sinners. Sometimes we look at sinners and we want to be so angry at them. We want to put them down and condemn them for what they've done. Reality of it is Christ could have done exactly that, which would have included us. We're here to, there to support education. We're there to be reformers. But mainly we're here to bring the message of, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. And the mission that we have in the church is unlimited. You know, Christ prayed for the worst, his persecutors. They weren't poor. Most of them were rich. And we, he's praying there for his persecutors. He does forgive them. And the book of Acts tells us in a later, at a later date, there was a, a great many priests who came to Christianity. The early church also points out the fact the early church was a Jewish church. The early church was one that when we look at it today, it's one that is worldwide. And our mission was to do exactly that. We're not there to just be respectable or intelligent. We're to be there to be respectable, be respected by the community because of our life. We're there to have people want to have what we have, a love, peace, and joy. But it should be something which draws people to us because we are like Christ, not because we're looking for joy. It didn't make a difference if it's a harlot or a thief, a persecutor, even Paul. And Paul comes to Christ, he's not trusted by the church. And I can understand that clearly. He was our enemy. He was killing Christians. You know what? After a while, the church learned to forgive him, and he became the greatest of the apostles. Churches there should be earnest. Christ is earnest as he's on that cross, very earnest, very open. He's looking for anything that he can as he deals with them to plead with God for him. He's hopeful. He's hopeful. He's still hopeful. Because he knows in the end his, his plan will be carried out. His redeemed will be redeemed and they will spend eternity with him. But we need to persevere. Even though through times like right now, where honestly we could perhaps look at it and say, 
I don't want to pers- I don't want to keep on going. I, I, I really want all this to quit. Why is it here? I think we're looking at the Lord's return, but that should spur us on to do what we need to do. The early church was noted during the bubonic plague era, especially very early on in the 300s and 400s. The early church was the one that helped the people who were dying or dead. They're the ones who removed the bodies from the streets. They used some Jewish customs, which kept many of them safe because the Jewish customs do exactly that. We need to persevere. We're not to be gazing or sitting. We're not to occupy a pew, but we're to be working because Christ's work still continues at his death. And I don't know that, that uh, I, we cannot see any place in scripture where our work on this earth continues, but I don't know what we're involved with in heaven. He serves and works even today, and he serves and works for us. And it ought to be something that you know what, the unsaved look at us and say, I want that. There's so many examples in church history where men and women as they face death Roman soldiers in one case said they went to death with a young girl who said that I want to have what this woman has. I see a strength. I see hope. I want to say beauty, but I don't mean it in the sense of physical beauty. I mean in the sense of a woman who, who truly was a woman of graciousness, who was a woman of strength, even though she was young. And her captor said, I want what they have. He's, we're there to say to the world, he forgives them. He can forgive them. And he is asking for them to realize that. I, I uh, have heard many things this past week that Christians may be responsible for the severity of this crisis. And that's still more true. In fact, it's a false statement that's made out of ignorance. But it's one that the world has used in the past. Nero used it to kill thousands of Christians in Rome. I think it could possibly be used and already is in India. We're seeing it be used today against Christians to say that <clears throat> they caused it. Even in America, we're saying Christians caused it or caused it to be worse. You know, just like Christ said, forgive them. But at the same time, he's, he's looking at our, our wickedness and he is willing to forgive us. These prayers all, and regardless of what's said, always end up with the same object in mind, his caring for other people and for us. Whether it's his mother, Mary, who he gives to John to take care of, he makes sure that his earthly job is done before he leaves. He's there to forgive the thief on the cross who simply asks, take me today to be with you in paradise. He's there to look at some of the centurions and when they they ask him for certain things, he so affected them that a centurion cries out and says, surely this is the son of God. And I think that uh, church history does tell us that that centurion would later become a Christian. I'll tell you something kind of interesting. Again, it's to the side. Centurion's graves, which have been found all over the old world, are full of things which would say they were Christians. I don't think I fully understand that, but it's like God is saying, I respect men who have faith. And these are men who not only have faith, but they're leaders. And they have had a decided effect upon the Roman world. We need to have a decided effect on this world. We need to be men and women who are forgiving, and yet we are also ones who can challenge the world to change what's being done. It's the Pharisees who refuse to acknowledge their pride. They, that, that became a sin that bound them up so that they would never be able to forgive Christ. Yet. In the end, many of them did, as did Paul, who was a Pharisee. Many of them did come to Jesus Christ. You know, Christ is not on that cross today, but he's praying for you. If you're here tonight, if you're with us tonight, he's there praying for you. He's there asking for your forgiveness. He's there to redeem you. 
takes the time. And during this time of, of crisis and during this time of chaos might be a really good time to have the time to think about what's important and what's beyond this life. And I challenge you that, that you'll do exactly that. Pick up the scriptures. Bend your knee and pray. And if you have questions, call the church and ask. We'll be glad to call you back and set up some kind of an arrangement where we can talk. Church number is 915-755-7232. And we'll be glad to set up a way that we can get together and answer questions. That's our job. Christian, hey, we're challenged to be forgiving. We're challenged to be like Christ. We're challenged to forgive those who've hurt us the worst. And in all things, to see that other people come to Christ. I can't think of any greater way than learn to be forgiving, learn to be gracious like this, like the young woman, <clears throat> learning to be one of, have a life full of joy, to have a life which draws people to Christ. And I pray that you might take a look at Christ as he's crucified. He's even willing to look at Pilate, his accuser, and many of the other people and say, there's no blame. Instead of there being blame, there's a forgiveness. And he warns us, though, that the time when he is there to forgive us is coming to an end. There's a time that's called the day of the Lord's wrath that's coming. It won't be a time of forgiveness. It will be a time of God's wrath. When that wrath starts, you and I won't be here. We'll be gone. But between the time that we are raptured, as we call it, and today, there's a lot that happens it's not very pleasant. It's our job, even when it's at its most unpleasant, it's our job to see that we're always there to draw people to us. So Christian, if your life is not one that is of forgiveness, if your life is not one where you exhibit to the world around us a strong, open faith, we need to do exactly that. And you know, the answer will be when we cry out. When we cry out to him and say, take us to be with you. The answer will be, today you shall be with me in paradise. And that's everlasting life with an everlasting body. I can't explain all of that. But I know for reality and scripture is talked about repeatedly. Please, I beg of you that you think about that.